For this last video of this series, we're going to look at how we classify minerals. So scientists like to classify things. You put them into groups based on what they have in common, and minerals are no exception. In this case, we're going to put minerals into categories based on their chemical composition. And just as a little aside, the picture's on your screen there. The one on the left is a sample of quartz. You've seen this one before. It's a beautiful smoky quartz. On the right, though, that is a mineral called rhodochrosite. And rhodochrosite is this pretty pink mineral. It's a really popular collector mineral because it's so lovely. Uh, this particular one comes from the Sweet Home Mine in Colorado. It's one of the premier locations for rhodochrosite. All right, so we'll start with the silicate minerals. The silicates are the most common type of mineral on Earth. They account for over 95% of the continental crust and almost 100% of the oceanic crust. It's actually a whole lot of the mantle too. So the Earth has lots and lots and lots of silicates. They're going to be built primarily out of a silicon tetra silicon oxygen tetrahedron. So a tetrahedron is a four-sided shape um, and so this is a silicon atom surrounded by four oxygen atoms so that gives it roughly a four-sided figure and so these are going to be based on how the different tetrahedrons are arranged in the chemical bonds when we talk about Bowen's reaction series I'm going to show you lots of different structures that come with these silicon and oxygen tetrahedrons but for now we're just going to keep it kind of simple all right so we can break these into two broad categories we have the light silicates and these are also known as non-ferromagnesian silicates. Now where this name comes from, ferro, is from the Latin for iron, and magnesian comes from magnesium. And since it says non, that means these don't have iron and magnesium. And we've talked before about how those elements tend to make minerals really dark in color. So if they don't have them, they're going to be lighter, which is why these are the light silicates. So some examples of those are Fran quartz we've been seeing over and over again. And you can see it's just one silicon and two oxygens in this case. We also have feldspars. So there's a whole lot of different choices in the cation position. That's the positive ions. Um, and so they vary pretty wildly, but over in the anions, you always have silicons and oxygen. So notice this is got a different ratio of silicon and oxygen and that's because of the different ways these tetrahedrons are put together. And you also have muscovite. Now all three of these minerals are rock forming minerals which means those are some of the most common minerals on earth and you're going to see them over and over and over again. Now muscovite was one of the mica minerals which means it has one plane of cleavage and peels off into really thin sheets. It's the lighter color of the two micas that we'll be seeing quite a bit of and you can see in its chemical structure there's nothing to make it particularly dark in color um, but it does have a different ratio of silicon and oxygens. On the other side, we have the dark silicate. So these have iron or magnesium in their structures that make them dark. Now, dark in color for the most part, um, and I'll show you a couple examples that don't look so dark, but they still count. For instance, olivine. Olivine has iron and magnesium, and then a silicon oxygen tetrahedron. So even though it's green, it's still considered a dark silicate. We have pyroxenes. Now this is a big group. There's lots of different types of pyroxenes. So in the cation position, there's a whole lot of different elements that can go in there. But it still has the silicon and oxygen. We also have the amphibole group, same deal. Um, the, chem the chemistry can vary quite a bit there, but you've always got four, oxy four silicons and 11 oxygens. And biotite, this is that other mica. The only difference between biotite and the muscovite is that iron and magnesium. If you look, compare it back to the chemistry of muscovite, it's exactly the same. And of course, last but not least here, we have garnets. So garnets are a silicate and they tend to be dark and have heavier elements in there. All right, we're gonna look at another type of mineral, the carbonates. The carbonates are recognized by the CO3 anionic group. So you're always going to have a carbon with three oxygens is the key here. So for instance, calcite. Calcite is a calcium carbonate. And it's that carbonate that makes it react with acid quite nicely, which is cool. 
Um, or dolomite. Dolomite's kind of like calcite's cousin. The only difference is it has a little magnesium added in there. And we also have the halides, and those are recognized by the presence, the presence of a halogen ion. So those are the halogen elements. So it includes things like chlorine or fluorine or bromine. So halite. Halite is a sodium chloride. You have the chlorine in there, so that makes it a halide. You can see the similarity in the names there. Or fluorite. This is a really popular collecting mineral because they tend to come in really nice colors of this purple you see and blues and greens and teals and sometimes colorless. We also have sylvite, and that's a potassium chloride, and this is also known as bitter salt. So it tastes salty, but not quite the same as halite. If you or someone you know has ever been put on a low sodium diet, um, you can use potassium chloride as a salt substitute, where you still get that salty flavor, um, but it's not the sodium that's in it. All right, we have oxides. Now, oxides are recognized by the oxygen anion. Now, carbonates had an oxygen, but those had to be always bonded to a carbon. In this case, it's just an oxygen by itself bonded to that anion. All right, so our first one, and one of the most common ones, is hematite. We've looked at hematite before. This is basically rust, so you can see it's an iron oxide. But magnetite is an iron oxide as well. Um, and so you can see the oxygen in that position for both of them. The difference between these two is the charge on the iron atoms. We also have corundum. Now corundum, when it's red, we call it a ruby. When it's blue, we call it a sapphire. They're both aluminum oxides. The difference between them is a little bit of other elements, little trace elements that get stuck in the chemical structure can change the colors. And believe it or not, ice is an oxide because it fits the pattern for the chemical. But when you think about it, a snowflake actually meets all five criteria to be a mineral. So we're going to talk about ice as we go through the semester in terms of being a mineral, in terms of being a sedimentary rock, like when snow falls, of being an igneous rock, like when it cools and freezes, or being a metamorphic rock in glaciers. So we'll revisit this a few times. Now, sulfides are characterized by a metal cation bonded to a sulfur anion. So you can see the sulfur anion right here. So galena, you've looked at galena before in one of the previous videos. It's a lead sulfide, which means it's really heavy. You have sphalerite is a zinc sulfide. In this case, it actually gives up the sulfur fairly easily. So sphalerite can be pretty stinky sometimes. Pyrite, or fool's gold, is an iron sulfide. Calcopyrite is a copper iron sulfide. This is actually mined as a copper ore sometimes. Or one of my favorites is cinnabar. Now cinnabar, if you look at its composition, that's actually a mercury sulfide. So the mercury makes this a particularly dangerous mineral. It's actually pretty deadly, uh, but this is the major ore that gets mined to create mercury. Um, back in the day when they had lots of mercury mines, um, the lifespan of somebody that just started working the mine was like six months. They'd assume you'd, you'd probably die within six months from mercury poisoning, which is pretty crazy. But cinnabar has historically been used for that bright red color um, in paints. For like the color of vermilion, if you've ever heard of the vermilion cliffs, it's that red, scarlet, red pigment, vermilion. Um, it was also used as a color in rouge cosmetics, um, which is pretty scary actually. So lots of people getting mercury poisoning that way. Now the sulfates are pretty closely related to the sulfides just because they both have sulfur. But in this case, that sulfur is bonded to four oxygens. So that's the big difference between. So if we look at some common sulfates, we have anhydrite, which is a calcium sulfate, um, and just kind of nice white crystals. 
We have barite, which is a barium sulfate. And this barium is actually a really heavy element. So barite tends to have a high specific gravity. It feels heavy, which makes it easy to recognize. And one of my favorites is gypsum. It's a calcium sulfate, just like anhydrite, but it has water in here, which is actually why this is called anhydrite, because it lacks the water that gypsum has. Now, this is a pretty cool picture, and I want you to take note. You see the people in there? They're actually in there for scale. This is a super famous mine down in Mexico that has huge gypsum crystals. I've actually met a guy who was one of the first Americans to ever go down into these systems. Um, it's in my, at a mining area in Mexico. Unfortunately, at this point, these mines are completely closed off, and most of the crystals have been destroyed because of dynamiting um, to do mining around the area has actually destroyed a lot of them. But these are amazing. And while they could get into them, they were going in and scientists were studying these pretty heavily. Um, but you can see they're in protective gear because it's like 120, 130 degrees constantly down in this mine. Plus, there's so much sulfuric acid in the air that you can't breathe very long. But the sulfuric acid makes sense because it was actually really sulfuric acid, heavy water that was able to create these big gypsum crystals, which is pretty gnarly. So our last type of minerals are the native elements. So these are minerals that are composed of only one element. And a lot of these you've heard of, right? Gold is just the element gold, but you can find that um, free in nature. You can find native copper, and that's uh, found in Arizona in quite a few places. Or diamonds, they're made of just carbon. Of course, there's diamond's cousin graphite, which is made of just carbon as well. We also have sulfur that's just made of sulfur, and this is actually commonly deposited around volcanoes. You have silver and, of course, platinum as well. Now, there's lots of other ones that are found um, in the world as minerals, but these are some really common ones. So you're likely asking yourself right now, do I need to memorize all these minerals and what category they fall into? Well, no, I won't be that mean to you. But if I give you a min minerals composition, you should be able to tell me which class it belongs into. All right. Um, so let's try a few of them. Rhodochrosite. You looked at one of these early on, right, from the Sweet Home Mine. What type of mineral is rhodochrosite? If you'd like to push pause right now and look at your notes and figure it out, you're more than welcome to, and I'll give you like a chance to hit pause. So go. All right, now, you hopefully you unpaused it or you've at least thought about it a little bit. So rhodochrosite, that's a carbonate. You can see that CO3 in its, in its formula. All right, here's another one, boronite, also known as the peacock ore. This is another copper mineral. We have lots of those in Arizona, so I like to give you lots of them. So here's your chance. Push, pause, and think about it. All right. I'm assuming you've unpaused now. Um, so boronite is a sulfide. So you can see it just has that sulfur there. How about cuprite? We're going on a, on a copper mineral spree here. What kind of mineral is cuprite? Go ahead and hit pause. Think about it. All right, hopefully you figured out that that was an oxide. One more, bismuth. You've probably seen these for sale. Um, the picture on the right, bismuth is, this is actually lab created. You can buy your own bismuth and grow these um, in your kitchen, actually, if you're into this. On the left is what it looks like in nature, though. Uh, so what type of mineral is bismuth? That one's a native element because it's just made of one element. All right, I lied. Here's another one. So, brochonite. This is another copper mineral that you find here in Arizona. What kind of mineral is it? All right, it's a sulfate because it's got the sulfur and the oxygen. Now, if you notice the OH, this is also a hydroxide. We're not going to worry about those for this. You've just got the, the main big ones that we went over. All right, so that concludes the last of it. I hope you enjoyed seeing lots and lots of minerals.